So it's finally here guys. Today we have our hands on the Fnatic CSL DD PlayStation Edition, or as they're calling it, the Gran Turismo DD Pro. So today we're gonna to be taking you through the full experience with the uh, complete ecosystem that we have inside the box. So you get the wheel, you get the uh, PlayStation edition of the CSL DD base, which does look a little bit different. So we'll do some comparisons with the standard CSL DD there. We also get the two pedal set, which we reviewed here recently as well. And uh, yeah, everything that you need to get up and racing is right there inside the box. So we're gonna take you through pricing and availability, pre-order information, the user experience, everything you need to know to decide whether this is a product for you. So let's get started. Okay, so I'm sure the big question that a lot of you are wondering about is what is the deal with pre-orders and availability here? So by the time you're watching this video, more than likely pre-orders will already be available. If not, then they won't be very far away at all. They will be happening on November the 26th. We don't have an exact time, unfortunately, but we'll keep you updated in the comments down below as well as on boostedmedia.net and our Facebook page. Uh, we'll keep you informed everywhere we possibly can. Discord as well, let you know what's going on. Now, in terms of availability, what they're telling us is that these will begin shipping in March of 2022 for pre-orders that are placed now, although you do have the option to pay extra for the standard package to get delivery before Christmas. Now, they do have a disclaimer there saying that every effort will be made to avoid delays, but due to the ongoing global shipping crisis, estimated delivery availability cannot be guaranteed. So we won't talk too much about that. Obviously, just pay attention to their various different social media platforms as well as their website for the latest information in regards to that. So let's run you quickly through pricing and different package options which are available here too. And we will put links down in the description below for all of these two. Now those will be affiliate links as well. So if you wanna help out supporting the channel, that is a great way of doing so with no additional cost to you. So thank you very much for the support there. And I should also say thank you very much to Fnatic as well for sending this across for us to check out for you guys today. So what we have on the table in front of us here is the standard Gran Turismo DD Pro package that comes in at, and unfortunately I don't have Australian or Japanese pricing here in front of me, only euros and, uh, and US dollars at this point, but I'm sure by the time you're watching this video, if not, uh, uh, very soon after it will be available across all the websites and again the links will be down in the description for each of the regions so this guy here the Gran Turismo DD Pro package comes in at 699.95 euros or US dollars and as I said before that comes with everything you need to get up and running so it comes with the pedals comes with the wheel comes with the base and it also does come with the table clamp as well which was an optional accessory on the standard CSL DD so great to see that they include everything that you need to get up and running straight out of the box now for those who are after a little bit more power than the five newton meter has to offer. And we do of course have the option of upgrading to the eight newton meter version with that boost pack 180. So that is an optional accessory which you can purchase separately of course, or you can buy it as a bundle. And that comes in at 849.95 US dollars or euros. So 150 more expensive. And for those of you who have watched our CSL DD review previously, you would know that with the five newton meter power supply, the experience is great, but with the eight newton meter, it is even better still. So we would definitely recommend if you can afford it to look at doing that. Then for those who want to take things one step further, again, you do have the option of the premium bundle, which of course comes with the boost kit 180, as well as the CSL pedal load cell kit. Now we did a review of that along with the CSL pedals just a couple of days ago here on the channel. So definitely check that out. But uh, spoiler alert, we were actually really impressed with this as well. We felt like it was a very worthwhile upgrade to the CSL pedal. So you're looking at a $370 upgrade or a little bit more than half the price again of the base kit to upgrade to the boost kit 180 and the load cell pedal, just so you guys are aware. And again, we will put links to all the various different options down in the description below the video to make it nice and easy for you guys. So under $1,000 for a full PlayStation compatible direct drive load cell experience is pretty darn impressive in my book. And I'm personally really excited to see how the direct drive experience translates across into consoles because it's genuinely not something that I've ever tried before. We did have the Podium Racing Wheel F1 package available from Fnatic previously. That was the only direct drive wheel that was uh, directly compatible without any adapters or anything with the PlayStation ecosystem. And that was $17.99.95, uh, which is you know obviously a lot more expensive than this is. And that didn't come with pedals at all. It also came with a formula style wheel. So if you wanted to drive anything that you couldn't really use a formula style wheel for, you're up for the cost of a wheel on top of that as well. So for PlayStation owners, this is definitely a very exciting product. Let's get it all unboxed now, show you exactly what you get inside the kit. And then we'll get into some more details around each individual component. Now we're not gonna spend too much time on the pedals today. I'll put a link to the pedal 
more of you above my head for you right now. We'll uh, we'll have a detailed look at the wheelbase, but we're not gonna go into the same level of detail that we did with our CSL DD review, where we pull it all apart and show you the internals and everything, simply because it is essentially the same base, just with a slightly different external design. Uh, all the specs are exactly the same, other than obviously the PlayStation compatibility. So if you wanna see teardowns and really get into the fine detail of exactly how it works, then definitely check out that review. Link above my head for you. But we'll definitely be taking a very detailed look at the wheel today, as well as just generally the overall package and how the experience translates across onto PlayStation. So let's do it. All right, first officially licensed direct drive product for PS5. Let's take a look. Pop the lid off here. Driven to perfection, it says on the top there. They always like to have that little message inside. So we've got a quick start guide there. Now they did put in their uh, reviewers notes here that the quick start guide wasn't gonna be final production quality, although that does look absolutely fine to me. Everything you need there to get yourself up and running. Uh, we don't think we really need to go into a whole lot of detail on that though. You guys know the uh, drill when it comes to quick start guides, but it does look like it has everything you need to, uh, yeah, understand exactly what you need to do to get up and running, which is good. Uh, it's got uh, diagrams for installing table clamps and all sorts of bits and pieces. We've got a all important sticker sheet there as well. So you can sticker bomb your rig or your desk or whatever you're gonna be using. So we've got a box here with, I'm guessing, accessories and bits and pieces. So we've got the uh, lever part for the table clamp. We've got USB cables. We've got spaces for pedals, uh, power cables, T-nuts for mounting the base itself. We'll talk about that in more detail later. Uh, yeah, all the little bits and pieces, USB cable in there as well. Get that out of the way. You guys don't really care about that, I know. Let's get into the stuff that you're interested in. So this is, and this is genuinely the first time I've had a look at it. This is the Gran Turismo wheel. So this is designed by Polyphony, who are the developers of Gran Turismo. So the wheel is actually designed specifically for the game, although it does work with other games, of course, as well. But they're also a subsidiary of Sony Interactive Entertainment themselves. So yeah, it's definitely a very interesting wheel, quite different from what we're used to from Fnatic. And we'll talk about the reasons why in just a minute, we'll run through everything in detail. But we've got a slight D shape on the bottom there, 280 millimeters as well, which is gonna make it nice and versatile for driving a wide variety of different vehicles, which is of course important if you're buying a kit where you don't wanna to have to buy extra components to be able to drive different types of cars. So lots of smart design choices there, I would say just at face value, but we'll set the wheel aside and let's lift out the next layer. We should have underneath here, there we go. So we've got the 90 watt power supply, I would imagine in here, yep. So the five Newton meter power supply. And then we've got the base itself. So I wanna be really careful how I lift this out because I don't wanna yank it from the stem. There we go, out she comes. All right, so really interested to see how different this is from the um, standard CSL DD. All right, there we go. Just balance it there, hold it back here again. So yeah, it actually, it's got kind of like a round shape to it as opposed to the square that we had with the CSL DD, but otherwise quite similar. Interesting little cutaway on the back here as well with the blue signature PlayStation ring on the back. We've got the, you can see how heavy it is. My arm's wobbling around trying to support it. Got a connection for the power supply, USB-C, and then our interfaces for our RJ12s for shifter shifter two pedal and handbrake, but we'll go through all of that in just a moment. And then also inside the box, if we lift up the next layer, it's actually really well packaged here. They've made really efficient use of the space available. So we've got part A of the table clamp, part B of the table clamp. I will tidy all this up in a moment so you can see properly. Got to uh, take mental notes of how this all went together as well for when I put it all back in the box. Uh, and then the pedals themselves are actually pre-assembled too, which is a nice touch. So you can see we've got our throttle on one side, our brake on the other, and they are bolted into position, unlike with the CSL pedal kit, when you buy it as a standalone product where you have to assemble it yourself. So you can obviously adjust these from side to side should you wish to do so, but we'll run you through all that in just a moment too. So set that, uh, where have I got space? Let's put it just here for now. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that is, everything you get inside the box. So let's go through it all methodically now, run you through each individual component in some detail. 
And then, uh, yeah, we'll get into the all important driving experience. Really keen to see how this goes on the PlayStation. So let's start off by taking a look at the wheelbase. Now, if you want to understand all the nitty gritty details about exactly how this works, looking inside it, having a look at the electronics and all those things, then definitely check out our CSL DD review that we've done previously, linked down in the description. What we're going to do today is just sort of keep it to the basic top level stuff that is important to understanding whether this is the right thing for you to buy. So uh, I guess one of the big questions that people have uh, comparing to other wheelbases on the market, there are a few other wheelbases on the market that are around the same strength level, remembering again out of the box as it comes, it's five newton meters of peak torque, uh, upgradable to eight newton meters with the upgraded Boost Kit 180 power supply. So as far as the motor is concerned, capable of eight newton meters peak torque. Now you might be comparing to something like the uh, CSL Elite wheelbase, which was PlayStation compatible, at least there was a PlayStation version of that wheelbase, around about the same kind of peak strength. But the really big advantage here, and this is the point that we really need to get across to you guys who might be new to direct drive technology, is what we have here is a motor shaft that is directly connected to the wheel. So everything that the motor is doing goes directly through to your hands. You're feeling every single little tiny detail there, good and bad. And uh, in some of the experiences that we've had with some direct drive wheelbases, it can actually sometimes be a negative thing if the software isn't up to scratch. So we'll definitely be looking at that and how it relates into console compatibility later on in the video. Now, peak torque aside, if we compare a direct drive wheelbase to something like a Logitech G920 or G923 uh, cog driven system, the benefit that we have from direct drive, even at the same torque level, is that we're not using a smaller motor and uh, you know stepping up the amount of torque that's delivered to your hands through a series of cogs. And what that means is that we're able to maintain high rotational speed and fast response time whilst also maintaining peak torque. Whereas with a cog driven system, there's always gonna be a trade off there. So if you gear up the gearing to the wheel, then you're gonna have slower response time. If you gear down so you get faster response time, then obviously you're gonna have less peak torque. So that's always the trade off there. Now, if we compare to a belt driven system like what we have with the Club Sport Wheelbase 2.5 or CSL Elite or the uh, higher end Thrustmaster models as of right now at least. They do have a direct drive wheelbase coming hopefully pretty soon so we'll be keen to check that one out. But comparing to belt driven we don't have that dampening effect that comes from the fact that you're using a belt. So again typically in belt driven wheelbases you'll see the use of a smaller motor. You'll see a pulley system which allows them to step up the gearing so you get more torque delivered to your hands for a smaller motor and lower power delivery but obviously at the trade off of response response time and overall rotational speed. So again, direct drive being the superior technology as long as it's well implemented. And that ultimately just comes down to the software. So with belt driven wheels, you do feel a little bit of dampening through the steering just caused by the fact that you're not connected directly to the motor. You're connected via a, uh, a big rubber band essentially. So you do get that slight little bit of squishiness there. And some of the high end belt driven wheelbases are absolutely fantastic. I really love the Club Sport Wheelbase 2.5, for example. That was my first expensive uh, wheelbase that I had on my sim rig after stepping up from a Logitech G27. And look, to be honest with you guys, I was perfectly happy with that wheelbase and would probably have used it forever if it wasn't for what I do for a job now. So I wanna put that in the proper context. But one of the trade-offs that you do have there is just that slight dampening effect that you feel through the steering. You don't quite get that sharp response that you get with a direct drive wheelbase like this. So that is the reason to look at direct drive as a superior technology to belt driven or cog driven systems. But again, it does come down to that software. And the reason why I keep harping on about that is because as we said before, any little nuances, any little details that you're getting through the motor, you're gonna feel in your hands. So if there's any sort of weirdness going on, any sort of robotic feeling, any graininess, anything like that, whether it's down to the characteristics of the motor itself or just the software implementation, all those little things you're always gonna feel through the wheel. Whereas with a belt driven wheel, you can get away with a little bit more because of that dampening effect that you get through the disconnection between your hands and the motor shaft itself. So hopefully all of that makes sense. Again, if you wanna understand more details about exactly how the motor works, check out our CSL DD review. But a couple of key things that I think are important to take you through in the context of today's video. We've got our quick release mechanism on the front here. Now this is the QR1 as Fnatic are now calling it. This will be upgradable to the QR2 system which is coming soon. Unfortunately, I don't don't have any details that I can share on that just yet, other than the fact that it will be quite a significant upgrade from the QR1. Uh, at least that's what I'm hoping for. So what we can do here is we can actually release 
the little bolt here on the collar and that entire assembly pops out. There's a little USB-C connection inside the shaft itself. Now that is a proprietary protocol there, so you can't just go and connect any USB-C device, but it's using what's called inductive coupling as well as an optical system for transmitting data and power through into the motor shaft. So they're able to get power and data across into the wheel without adding any friction or any you know contact between surfaces internally on the motor. So all the only resistance that you feel in there is just the mechanical resistance from the motor itself. So we're not gonna talk about graininess or feeling in the motor shaft until we're powered up because that is not the correct way to talk about electric motors. The Fnatic CSL DD and the Gran Turismo DD Pro both use a technology that they call flux barrier technology. And what that essentially does is it uses magnetic fields internally in the motor to cancel out any sort of torque ripple or cogging effect that you might feel. So if I spin the motor around freely like this when it's not energized, you can feel some slight little uh, changes in resistance as we spin the motor, it's not completely smooth, but once we actually power things up, that for the most part goes away. We'll talk about that later once we get up and driving, of course. Now, one other thing to mention here, just while we're talking about the motor shaft, if you have a look in the side here, you can see what looks like plastic going through into the housing itself. So that is actually a composite carbon material. And the reason they've used that is to reduce the rotating mass. Obviously it's kind of like unsprung weight in a car, increases the response time and reduces the amount of load on the motor overall. So lots of little details like that that they've used just to get the optimum performance for minimal cost. Obviously, uh, you know, the cheaper they can make these things, the better for us. So it's all good in that regards. Now, if we spin it around side on, we can see this middle section here is made of aluminium. So this is all basically just a giant heat sink which bleeds heat away from the core of the motor itself. The front fascia here is plastic and the rear fascia or rear cover is also plastic. So very similar, if we put it side by side with the uh, CSL DD non-PlayStation version, you can see basically exactly the same. Now the actual dimensions are exactly the same as well. So if we quickly have a look at that, We've got 160 millimeters wide, and then I'll just move this guy aside again quickly. And what have we got there? About 150 millimeters deep to the front of the actual motor housing itself. Now, obviously, the distance between the wheel and the back of the motor will vary depending on the wheel that you're using. Uh, we'll give you a measure. We'll flash a measurement up on the screen to show you the distance between the front of this wheel and the back of the base, just for those who might be wondering. Uh, but yeah, exactly the same dimensions as we had with the CSL DD. And again, if we bring them side by side, you can see the aluminium profile channels here, which are used for side mounting as well as bottom mounting. So both bases have channels on the bottom and you can use those for inserting the included T-nuts which come in this little bag and those can slide in and that will allow you to mount these on any wheel deck which is compatible with any of the other Fnatic bases out there. So you can configure it as a four hole pattern like what you have with a DD1 or DD2 or a three hole like what you would have with a Clubsport wheelbase 2.5 or CSL Elite wheelbase. Now one little note just quickly and this is something that we mentioned in the CSL DD review these T-nuts don't have any little spring-loaded mechanism here, so they don't have a little spring ball or a leaf spring or anything like that. So they do tend to slide around inside the slots when you're trying to mount it, which can be a bit of a pain. Now, we did call that out in the CSL DD review, but I'm gonna call it out again simply because, you know, for the tiny little bit of extra cost that it would be to have a spring ball or leaf spring style T-nut, you know, it's just gonna make that initial experience of getting it mounted up on your rig just that little bit more, I guess, streamlined. That was one of the things that did really frustrate me getting this mounted, trying to line everything up and it's moving around and it's just, it's just a pain. So one thing that I definitely would like to see them improve. But yeah, otherwise, very, very similar in design. So you can see again, in both cases, even though we do have this kind of faux grid pattern here on the front that is just a solid piece of plastic it is completely passively cooled so there's no cooling fans there's no moving parts internally with regards to cooling which could wear out over time and get noisy or anything like that it means it's nice and quiet in operation too direct drive wheelbases are almost always a lot quieter than their belt driven or cog driven counterparts so that is an important point to note as well but look otherwise pretty much absolutely identical to each other the only other difference that we can see is the CSL DD actually has a USB-C connection for a uh, external data connection, which we've never actually seen a use for, that is not present on the Gran Turismo DD version. Otherwise, other than the aesthetic design, 
absolutely identical to each other. So that is the motor. And again, we will go into more detail on a few other bits and pieces when it comes to software and button configuration and all those things once we get up and mount it on the rig and go for a drive. Uh, other thing I should mention as well, of course, is the table clamp. So this does come included as well. And this is actually a really cool design. You can see these little bits of plastic here line up with our T-slot channels on the base. We also have another piece in here, so this is gonna screw in like so. That's gonna slide into the channels as well. This piece is gonna go underneath like that. This is gonna go through here. And then we also have this little knob which is removable so you don't bang your knees on it, but uh, that gives you just a little bit of extra leverage for tightening it down or clamping it down on your table. So once you've got everything assembled like that, all you need to do is just slide your base on like so, and that just clamps directly to your table. Now we were actually really impressed with the table clamp. We did test it extensively when we did our CSL DD review, but basically this is as sturdy as your table is. So if you've got any movement in your table, obviously things will wobble around and obviously being a direct drive wheelbase, you do obviously wanna make sure that you're not dampening any of those effects through having movement anywhere on your rig. So the more solid of amount that you can have, the better experience you're gonna have with the product overall. And uh, yeah, so basically if you've got a solid table, it's gonna be mounted solid. If your table's moving around all over the place, it will diminish the, uh, the overall benefits that you get from such a nice shiny wheelbase. But I think that covers pretty much everything we need to with regards to the base itself. We'll talk about the power button and different modes once we get up and running on the rig a little bit later. So let's take a more detailed look now at this polyphony designed GT wheel. Now, the first thing I'm sure a lot of you are thinking when you see this is, doesn't it look exactly the same as the Thrustmaster one? Yes, it does look very similar. There are some differences there, obviously, but you can see how the polyphony design has kind of carried across. And obviously they have very strict regulations when it comes to what a licensed wheel needs to look like to be licensed for Gran Turismo, which is the reason why they look quite similar. So I just wanted to explain that. Now, the first impression that I have of this wheel is obviously it is a lot cheaper than the Fnatic wheels that a lot of people will be used to. So we've got a selection of wheels beside me here from the various different ranges from the Podium series, which is the Porsche 911 GT3 R wheel. Now, obviously you can see this wheel is way, way, way nicer than what we have here. But to put it in perspective, this wheel only costs $50 less than the wheel, the base, and the pedals all combined. So, you know, it is important to have that perspective. Obviously, we're not comparing it against something that costs that much money. If we step down the range to something like a club sport wheel, again, you can see this has got the nice Alcantara. It's got the genuine carbon fiber on the front as well, whereas this is all plastic. The buttons do feel a little bit nicer on this as well, although it's not a massive difference. If we step down to the CSL Elite range, something like the McLaren GT3, this is definitely a lot closer, very similar rubber grip. And one thing I do wanna highlight here is that Tom has been using this wheel extensively for the better part of, will be well over six months now, and it's got absolutely no wear and tear on it whatsoever. It still looks pretty much like brand new other than a few little scratches from, you know, being moved around between the studio and his house. But yeah, in terms of from general usage, it's, it's worn very, very well. So I would expect the same uh, levels of durability from this wheel as well. But then if we go down to the WRC wheel for comparison, this is much more similar in terms of quality. So we do still have a metal face here. We do still have Alcantara, but the buttons are about the same quality. We do have the snap dome shifters on this wheel as well, which we don't have on the GT wheel. So look, it's probably still a small step down in quality from this wheel, I would say. It's kind of like a sub range to the CSL Elite range, I would say. But having said that, the fit and finish, the quality, does still feel good. It just feels that little bit cheaper than the other Fnatic wheels which are on the market currently. So, you know, if you do own other wheels, I just wanted to, you know, make that reference so that you, you know, kind of knew what to expect from this one. But if this is your only wheel, if you're stepping into the ecosystem for the very first time, then I don't think anybody's going to be disappointed with the quality, particularly for the price. So, you know, nice plastic construction. We do have the interchangeable quick release here as well. We do have the simplified one on there by default, and we'll show you how that works when we get up on the rig in a moment. But you can swap that out for the metal quick release on here should you wish to do so. 
this is a bit of a strange one because I've seen a lot of people complain about creaking and groaning and you know problems with the simplified quick release. Personally, I haven't had any issues with it at all, neither has Tom. Uh, so we've actually been recommending that people don't bother to upgrade to the metal quick release. But a lot of people disagree with me on that as well. So read around, have a look at experiences and make your own decision on that one. And that kind of just goes to highlight the importance of getting multiple opinions on these kinds of things. But given that this wheel is intended to be used with a PS4 or PS5, probably the best point of reference that I can give you for something that you probably already own is actually the dual sense controller that comes with your PlayStation. Very, very similar quality in terms of the plastics and just the overall fit and finish and feel of the module itself. So yeah, if you own one of these, then the quality that you're getting here is about the same. And that again makes sense given that this is designed by Polyphony, which is a subsidiary of Sony. So yeah, there you go. So in terms of the quality, I think given again the price point and all the other things that we're getting included in the kit, this is not gonna be a disappointment to anybody. And of course, you do have the option of upgrading to different wheels as well, should you wish to do so. So for me personally, I'm, I'm glad that they've kind of gone with a more entry level wheel and kept the price of the overall kit down so the barrier to entry is lower rather than forcing you to pay more for a more expensive wheel when people may not want that. So yeah, I think that this is, this is good for what you're paying for the overall product. But let's hone in a little bit more on the actual features here. So you can see we've got four five-way switches here. So one, two, three, four, and then push down. And that isn't fully implemented yet. We're gonna see the full integration with Gran Turismo 7. So we'll have a lot more information to speak about once the game is released or close to release, hopefully. But otherwise, we've got a very familiar layout here with all your standard PlayStation buttons. We've got our OLED display on here as well, which gives us access to the tuning menu as well as telemetry. We'll look at that in more detail and how that integrates with the system once we're up and driving. We've got our tuning menu button here as well, which allows us to make on the fly changes to our force feedback, braking force and so forth. And then hidden away just up the top here as well is what they're calling a rev stripe. So I'm assuming at this point that it's some sort of RGB LED strip that you can configure somehow. So we'll look at that when we get up and running in the software as well. But look, overall, that's pretty much all there is to say about it. interchangeable quick release as we mentioned. The shifters don't have an overly remarkable feel to them. You know, they're just a spring-loaded mechanism with a micro switch in there. So there's no neodymium magnets in there or anything like that to improve the shifter feel. And if you compare it to something like the McLaren wheel, for example, that's got a much more positive intentional click to it than what we have with this wheel. But I'm sure somebody will come up with some sort of a magnetic mod add-on, something 3D printed, no, no doubt that will bolt onto the back here and you know make these feel a lot better than they do out of the box. But there's certainly no problem with it. And again, coming from a game controller, you're certainly gonna be happy with this if you're driving with it. So yeah, no problems there at all. Otherwise, we've got our PlayStation button, we've got our L buttons, R buttons, and we've got our multi-directional switch here as well, which is just a digital pad, just like what we would have on our controller up here. Now, ergonomically, I think it's quite an intelligent design as well, being 280 millimeters, nice and versatile. Uh, actually, the same diameter as the Asher Racing wheel that I've been using for all of my GT3 racing recently. I find the 270 mil that we get with the Fanatec uh, Formula wheels is a little bit narrow for some people. It's, it suits quite well to Formula One or Formula style driving, but GT3s, it can be a little bit on the twitchy side, particularly with a stronger direct drive wheelbase. So 280 millimeter, I think is a good middle ground. And this wheel is gonna suit the majority of different driving styles. And the reason I mentioned I prefer to have a round bottom is simply because if you're drifting and you need to be able to slide the wheel through your hands without your hands banging around, then that can make a little bit of a difference there. But the the D shape is very, very subtle. And yeah, we'll, we'll comment on it more when we get up and driving in just a moment. But look, otherwise, I'm happy with it. So let's move on to the pedals. So super quick look at the pedals here. We did literally just review these along with the load cell kit just the other day. So I'll put a link above my head for you right now so you can check out the full review on these. But just to give you the quick rundown on these, we've got Hall Effect sensors in both pedals. So it is position based rather than load based. We do have the option to upgrade to the full kit as we have here with the tuning kit metal pads on the front, as well as the load cell kit. It is quite a bit more expensive, around 130 US dollars, if I recall correctly, for the load cell kit, but that does vastly improve the braking experience. So definitely would recommend that if you do have the extra money. But that is not to say that you can't have a good experience, particularly if you're coming from a hand controller or maybe a more entry level set of kit. These pedals are gonna be absolutely fine for you. But just to quickly run you down on the key features here, Hall effect sensors in both pedals, so we don't have any moving parts like we have with potentiometers. That reduces the amount of wear and tear. We've got a little foam insert in the back here 
So that squishes down and provides the mechanical resistance as we push down on the pedal. It is quite soft, so you will have to sort of adapt to that. But again, coming from a more entry level set of pedals, I don't think that you're gonna have too many problems adapting to that. And it is gonna feel better than what you would be used to if you're coming from say a Logitech G923 or something like that. So looking at the face here, metal face plate or metal heel plate, I should say, all we need to do is just remove the four screws that allows us to move the pedals from side to side. And if you don't want to fork out the money for the load cell kit, there is the option of a separate clutch pedal, which you can add on to this as well. So a nice modular design here. It does have just a single RJ45 connection for connecting directly into the wheelbase by default. If you go with the load cell upgrade kit, you can connect that via USB as well. But again, in the context of playing on a console, you're going to want to run all your peripherals back to the base and then run the base connection via USB back to your console. So that's not really a concern here either. But yeah, look, overall, we were actually really impressed with these pedals, particularly for the price. We thought they got the job done, got the job done very well. There's no real flex anywhere. Everything feels nice and solid. Everything feels nice and premium. And we felt like even though, you know, you can definitely see where they've saved some cost in manufacturing, they haven't saved cost in the areas where it's important and, um, you know, is going to be detrimental to the overall driving experience. And, you know, even though they do look quite bare bones, they have all the things that are necessary to get a good experience for the price. So that is the pedals. And again, if you wanna understand more about these, I know I'm skimming through it very quickly, but we have a very, very detailed review, which we just posted up a couple of days ago. So you can check that out if you wanna know more about the pedals. But yeah, that is everything we need to go through in terms of hardware on the table. Let's get this hooked up on the rig now. We're gonna mount it on our Next Level Racing FGT Elite. Remembering again that we do have the option for side mounting, which is what we're gonna be doing, as well as mounting from the base. And we do of course have the table clamp as well, should we wish to use that. But we're gonna get it mounted up on the rig so it's nice and solid for you guys. We get the best possible experience out of the base. And yeah, let's get in and see how it runs on the PS5. Okay, so base and pedals are all mounted up on the Next Level Racing FGT Elite rig now. So let's show you, first of all, how to put the wheel on. So simply make sure your simplified quick release is in the unlocked position. So the collar rotates like that. So we move it all the way to the unlocked position. Slides on like so, all the way in as far as it'll go. And then you simply rotate the collar around. There's a little white line just on the collar there. You tighten it up until you meet that white line. You don't want to over tighten it because you can cause damage. And that is it. We should get illumination on the screen there as well. We've got a little uh, Fanatec logo lighting up to let us know that everything is connected. Now, if it's the first time you've connected it, you might get the calibration uh, indicator on the screen, just a flashing uh, display that says Cal. All you need to do is press the uh, menu button and the X button together. Uh, holding the wheel into the center position, push those two buttons. And then once you've done that, the flashing cowl should disappear and you should be calibrated. Now, if you ever need to calibrate again, all you need to do is enter the tuning menu, pressing the tuning menu button, and then press the menu and X button again with the wheel centered like that. And uh, that would be it. So we'll cover off the usual things that we look at when we test out a uh, wheel and a wheelbase. So first of all, flex on the stem there. I'm not seeing any flex in the actual stem itself on the wheelbase. There is a little bit of flex there just in the back of the wheel where the plastic interface is between the quick release and the wheel itself. Not too much there though. There's definitely no play at all. And that's one of the things that I've always liked about this design with the rotating collar. It does tighten and clamp down quite well. I've heard a few people complain on other wheels about creaking and groaning in that quick release as we mentioned earlier, but absolutely nothing going on at all with this wheel. That's absolutely silent. So at least so far, so good. We'll let you know how it goes over time, of course, if it does develop any issues. But yeah, minimal flex there. The wheel is pretty nice and solid too. I can, you know, twist that around and I'm, I'm putting forces through there that I would never actually do when I was driving just to sort of test it. But, you know, it doesn't feel like it's gonna break or anything. Nice and solid and, you know, normal driving. Obviously you'll see in just a minute whether it's moving and bouncing around while we're driving in real time. So I don't really need to tell you, you guys will be able to see for yourselves, but I don't anticipate there's gonna be anything there that um, I would notice when I'm driving. I'll let you know if I do notice anything. Now, ergonomics wise, pretty clean layout here. We can reach the navigation button here with our thumb without having to take our hand off the wheel entirely. To hit your L2, R2 buttons, you will need to roll your hand around quite a lot. So it's not an easy reach, but the four five-way switches are very easily reachable without having to rotate your hands around too much at all. So all the controls are nice and accessible. The shifters do have a relatively short throw. So, you know, they're, they're not anything special, let's just say, but they're not underwhelming either. I mean, they, they feel pretty much actually exactly the same as the shifters on a um, Logitech G920 or any of the Logitech G series uh, wheels, if you've ever used one of those. So just spring loaded with micro switches. There's no sort of 
defined contact point there. You can kind of just pull on the switch until it clicks and it'll activate. But again, of course, you do have the option to upgrade your wheel should you wish to do so. But this is a pretty good all-round versatile wheel as we were discussing before. So let's just quickly run through the tuning menu as well. Now we do have another video where we went through every single menu option and exactly what it means how to fine tune it to your preference. So we won't go into a massive amount of detail here, just run you through the basic stuff so you get an understanding of what you can do here. So if we push on the little button just here, that accesses the tuning menu. And we can see we have AS or A set and C set. So A set means automatic setting. That means that the game is responsible for all the settings and the wheel just takes on whatever the game tells it to do. You can't customize anything or fine tune anything on top of that. So if you're wanting the most basic get up and running, then that may be for you. Uh, then we can also scroll up to C set or custom set. That allows us to go in and fine tune a whole bunch of menu options. So if we push to the right now, you can see we have an adjustment for sensitivity. That is the sensitivity of the wheel in degrees or how far you have to turn the wheel to represent a certain amount of movement inside the game. So generally that is set to automatic. Most games are pretty good at matching that, but some games you might want to tweak a little bit. For F1 specifically, sometimes I like to crank that down to 320 instead of the default 360, just to make the car a little bit more sensitive to quick changes in steering. But really that's just a personal preference thing. If we scroll across to the right, we have an adjustment for our force feedback strength. And then if we scroll to the right again, we have an adjustment here for natural damper. That allows us to filter out a bit of the twitchiness in the wheel if it's a problem for us and just you know fine tune it to be either a little bit more smooth or a little bit more responsive you know and again it's a purely subjective thing so it's great that we do have the option to adjust that so that is the basic mode as it comes out of the box you can also press and hold the tuning menu button to switch into advanced mode so if you hold it down it says change to advanced mode and now if we scroll across We've got adjustments for sensitivity, force feedback strength, force feedback scaling, natural damper, natural friction, natural inertia, force feedback intensity, force effect intensity, overall force, spring return strength, damper, brake level, shock vibration, and so forth. So again, go and check out that other video if you wanna understand what all of those adjustments mean. But essentially what that's allowing you to do is really dial in the settings to get the absolute most out of the experience for your particular personal preference. And it's great that you still do have that level of granular adjustment even even on a console. It's something that you certainly didn't have back when I was uh, running a G27 on a console years ago. So we also have the ability to switch between profiles here as well. So if we push up and down, you can see set one, set two, set three, set four, and set five. So if you're driving various different cars that you'd like to have different settings for, or maybe different sims or different games, then you can set up a profile for each one of those games and quickly switch between them without having to go in and do anything else. So everything can be done directly from the wheel. And that is one of the things that I absolutely love about the Fnatic ecosystem in general, whether you're playing on a PC or a console, just having that ability to go in and fine tune things on the fly without having to alt tab from the game if you're on a PC or go into menus or anything on a, uh, on a console console is a really big plus. So let's exit back out of the tuning menu now. And there's one more thing I need to cover here, which is the different compatibility modes for the wheelbase. So at the moment, the light is lit up blue. That means we're in native PS4, PS5 mode. If we hold down this button and push the power button momentarily, it changes to red, that is PC mode. So for connecting directly to a PC, we push it again, we get purple, which is compatibility mode for PS4 and PS5. So basically what that means is the wheelbase is detected as a CSL Elite wheelbase, and that allows games which don't yet have support for this particular wheelbase to still have force feedback and button compatibility. Now, they tell us that the uh, quality of the force feedback isn't impacted by running in compatibility mode, and that has certainly been our experience as well, both on the CSL DD, other wheelbases from Fnatic as well. We've never actually noticed a difference running between compatibility mode or native mode, so you can definitely use that if you need to. Push it again, we get yellow, which is PC compatibility mode. Again, for games on PC, which don't support the uh, CSLDD natively, detects it as a, uh, I think it's a Club Sport wheelbase 2.5, it detects it as actually. We push it again, goes to blue again for our native PS4 and PS5 mode. So very easy to switch between modes. The one thing I am gonna say though, is I really wish that that light wasn't shining directly in your eyes. Maybe just have it underneath or you know to the side or something like that. You don't see it with this particular wheel connected. And you know, for majority of wheels, you're probably not gonna see it to be honest, but I just it's something that I've nitpicked on every single wheelbase that we've tested that has a light shining towards you. So I have to be consistent. I have to call it out on this one as well, of course. But you know, it's not super, super bright, but if you are playing in a dark room, it may annoy you. You could always just put a little bit of tape over it or something like that, so it's not a big deal. So we're out on track in Bahrain in F1 2021 now. I just wanted to quickly show you one more thing before we go for some driving. So you can see here, I'm out running, all my buttons are working. I can change through my gears. 
and everything is happening. One of the things that I really love about the Fnatic ecosystem is you can do this. So we just loosen off the wheel, pop it off, grab our formula wheel, pop it on, and you can see there will be some minor adjustments in mapping and things like that if we've got any special buttons assigned. But in terms of just getting on and driving, I can change gears, I can do all those things. I didn't have to go into any menus, I didn't have to reconfigure anything, didn't have to reboot anything. Everything just works straight away. So just wanted to uh, show you guys that as well for those who might be wondering about changing in between wheels depending on what you're doing. So if you know, changing cars on the fly or something like that, it is very, very easy to do. Now in the interest of keeping this video as to the point as possible, one of the things that I always test for is just general smoothness in the wheel and you know, just any sort of graininess or anything that kind of takes away from the immersion, anything that kind of distracts you from the, uh, from the experience of driving a real car. Now, as we mentioned previously, this wheelbase is essentially exactly the same as the uh, CSL DD, just a PlayStation compatible version. So if you wanna, understand more about all those little characteristics in really fine detail. There's a really long section in our original CSL DD video where we took you through all those things. So uh, what I'll do is I'll link above my head for you right now straight to the timestamp in that video so you can watch through all that. I won't make you sit through it all again in today's video. What we're going to do now is we're going to switch across to a bit of a driving montage. We're going to test this out in a couple of different games in the PS4 and then we'll bring everything together with our overall conclusions about the experience on PlayStation as well as on PC and we'll call it a day. So we put the Gran Turismo DD Pro through its paces with a wide variety of different styles of games in the uh, PS5 environment, as well as a PS4 legacy game, Assetto Corsa Competizione. Now, unfortunately, Gran Turismo 7 isn't available just yet. Uh, I know people are itching to get their hands on it. So we couldn't test the wheel in its native environment, so to speak. We couldn't map the uh, four five-way switches in any of the games that we tested today. So we'll definitely revisit that once GT7 comes out. But look, really the experience varied quite, uh, quite a lot depending on the style of title that we were playing. So if we start with something like Assetto Corsa Competizione. I was actually really impressed with the quality of the force feedback. Uh, comparing it to the uh, PC environment, it actually wasn't all that much different. All the same adjustments that you have for force feedback inside the game and in the PC environment, you also have on the uh, on the PS4 environment. And because you have access to the tuning menu on the wheelbase as well, you were able to dial in and uh, I was able to find settings that I was quite comfortable with. Now, just for contrast there, even with my Simicube 2 Ultimate on my daily driver PC based sim, uh, Assetto Corsa Competizione is a title that I've actually struggled to get feeling uh, to my liking, let's just say. So yeah, I was actually really impressed with how this performed in a PlayStation environment, particularly when you consider just how easy it is to get things up and running. It literally took me maybe three minutes to sort of figure out what settings I'd like based on my previous experience, of course, dial it all in and I was up and running pretty much straight away. So that was good. So moving down from the more simulation based titles to the more arcade style titles, F1 2021, that also felt quite good to me. Um, yeah, I was overall pretty impressed with it. It didn't quite feel as good as it does on PC, didn't quite have the same level of detail just in the really fine textures that you have on PC, but I thought it did a pretty darn good job. And again, considering the uh, ease of use there, I think, you know, it was pretty darn impressive to be honest with you. Now, moving down to WRC 10, I found the force feedback there to be quite vague. I did spend quite a bit of time fine tuning settings and I just never really felt like I was taking full advantage or even close to full advantage of what this piece of hardware had to offer there. And similar kind of story with with Dirt 5 as well. Obviously that is a lot more arcade style and it's not really intended to be played with hardware like this. You definitely can play it and enjoy it, but yeah, it's really just not taking full advantage of the hardware. And I think that experience translates across to the boost kit as well. I definitely found the boost kit advantageous when I was driving in the Seto Corsa Competizione, uh, but the other titles, I just didn't really feel like it added all that much. It made things a little bit stronger, but because the force feedback was a little bit more vague anyway, it just felt like the return that you were getting on the investment for the boost kit was diminishing as you went more and more into the arcade style games, which again, I'm sure isn't really a surprise to anybody. So definitely 
would recommend it if you can afford it for a more simulation experience, but for more arcade, I just don't think that it's worth the extra money. So really the takeaway there is pretty much what we expected going into this. The more high-end the hardware is, the more dependent you are on good quality simulation to begin with. Obviously the lower you go down into the more arcade style games, the less you're taking advantage of the hardware. And I'm sure that's not gonna be a surprise to anybody, but when it came to the more simulation style titles, I was very impressed with how closely it was matched to the experience that you have on a PC. Now again, remember this is PC compatible, and if you are wanting to know more about the driving experience on PC, definitely check out our CSL DD review where we went into a bunch of detail on that. Exactly the same experience on the Gran Turismo DD Pro as we had on the CSL DD, so no need to go through all of that again for you guys. So focusing in on the wheel now specifically, the ergonomics here are great. Uh, the buttons are nice and easy to reach. Unfortunately, we, as I said, we couldn't make use of the, uh, the five-way switches, so that was a little bit disappointing, but obviously we'll retest that when we can get our hands on GT7 before too long, hopefully. The L and R buttons are a little bit more difficult to reach. You do have to curl your hands around a little bit to reach them. Not a big deal, but you know, it is something just to be aware of. But otherwise, ergonomically, the wheel is quite comfortable. The shifters do an adequate job. They're nothing particularly remarkable, but you know, they don't feel horrible either. And I'm sure that somebody will come up with some sort of magnetic paddle mod that will improve the feeling of those shifters for quite cheap as well. So I'm not too concerned about that. And look, size-wise, as we mentioned earlier in the review, I think 280 millimeters is a really good choice, nice and versatile. For me personally, I would like to see a round bottom, even though it's only a really subtle D-shape, it does just sort of limit the ability to do drifting because it does bounce around in your hands just a little bit there. But again, it is a very versatile wheel and I think very well designed for the purpose overall. So we'll revisit that once we get our hands on GT7 and really take advantage of all the features. But the OLED display works well for accessing the tuning menu. We've got the RGB LEDs across the top here as well, which again, we're not really taking full advantage of until we have GT7. So we'll revisit that later on for you guys as well. But yeah, look, overall, again, for the price, I'm quite impressed with the wheels. So on to the pedals now. Uh, and again, we've reviewed these pedals just a couple of days ago, so definitely check out that video. Uh, if you're more into the hardcore simulation, then I would absolutely recommend you go for the load cell upgrade. I really do think that that's a no-brainer if you can afford it. You can learn to drive quickly and consistently with the standard brake. There's nothing wrong with the standard brake, but the experience with the load cell is just a whole heap better. So if you can afford it, definitely recommend that. Overall, again, for the price point, I think these pedals do a very good job. They're nice and rigid. There's no side-to-side -side movement or play. There's no slop. There's no dead zone. Uh, we do have hall effect sensors as well, so longevity should be really good. So if you're wanting to know more about them, check out the full review. So in conclusion, I guess the best way I can summarize this overall experience using the Gran Turismo DD Pro package over the last couple of days, I think, yeah, this sort of keeps coming back to me in my mind is if you'd asked me a year ago whether it was worth investing in a direct drive wheelbase for console sim racing, I probably would have said that you're crazy and that's my honest opinion. I know a lot of people would disagree with that, but in the case of the PlayStation, at least, the only compatible direct drive wheelbase without using third-party adapters was the Podium Racing Wheel F1, which was $1,800 US dollars, and that's without any pedals and only a formula-style wheel. So if you wanted to drive anything else, you'd be forking out for a wheel on top of that price as well. So I think that at that price, it was quite prohibitive, and it made more sense, at least to me, to put that money towards a sim racing PC, because generally speaking, PCs do give you a wider variety of you know options when it comes to sim racing. You've got all the modded content in the Seto Corsa, which you just don't get on a console, a lot of extra titles to play around with as well. And I think, you know, most people will agree that when you really start to go down the rabbit hole of sim racing, inevitably at some point, you will be investing in a PC to, you know, really get the most that sim racing has to offer. But this, honestly, for me, is a, is a game changer. It's, it's changed my mindset completely towards what it means to, you know, look at more high-end gear in the context of console racing. So I think really where this product is outstanding is that not only does it provide a really excellent console experience, but it also provides a fantastic experience on PC as well. So I consider this as somewhat of a gateway into high-end sim racing equipment. So I honestly believe that if you were to buy this kit with the uh, load cell and the boost pack, so under a thousand US dollars, it's probably going to be the last gear that you're going to buy for a very long time, unless you really really start to go down the rabbit hole of sim racing. Remembering again that we do have the table clamp as well, and that does work quite well, although I probably wouldn't recommend using it so much with the boost kit unless you do have a really sturdy table. But at five Newton meters, it's absolutely fine with the table clamp. Again, the pedals with the load cell as well, you will need a pretty solid rig to mount that on, so just do keep that in mind. And again, that was referenced in the pedal review video if you wanna dig more into that. But 
yeah, I guess what I'm saying here is that this is, you know, very much everything that you're going to need for a fantastic high-end sim racing experience at a very, very low price. And really the only thing that you might want to upgrade sooner rather than later is just looking at a couple of additional wheels to suit various different types of driving a little bit more than a one-size-fits-all wheel like this one. And I really do genuinely believe that what we're looking at here today, including the load cell and the boost pack and a solid cockpit to mount it all on, is more than enough to satisfy the majority of sim racers out there. And again, as I said before, a fantastic fantastic gateway into more serious sim racing. So I wouldn't have a problem with investing in something like this on a console and then looking at potentially upgrading to a PC further on down the track. So let's just quickly recap on the various different configurations which are available and who I think they're going to be most suited to. So if you're a more casual sim racer, if you're more playing sort of arcade style games but you do want to look at a direct drive wheelbase, maybe you're starting to look into getting into more serious sim racing but you still want to stick with a console for now, then I think that what we've got here on the table in front of us right now is probably the best bet. I don't think you need to spend more on the boost pack or the load cell, particularly if you don't have a solid rig. If you are going to be driving with your pedals on carpet or on a floor and your wheelbase clamped to the table or on a relatively entry-level wheel stand or rig, then this is probably the best bet for you. There's really no need to spend any more money than this. I think if you're wanting to get into the more serious side of sim racing, then I would definitely recommend first and foremost investing in that load cell. Of course, remembering that you will need to have a solid rig to mount it on as well. I think that the, uh, I think that the load cell provides more value value to the overall sim racing experience than the boost pack does. And that's been something that I've said for a very long time. I think pedals and a solid rig are far and away the most important thing when it comes to driving quickly and consistently. So I would prioritize load cell over boost kit. Next upgrade that I would do would be the boost kit. And yeah, I think if you're looking at getting into more serious sim racing, you're really wanting to sort of get stuck into those kinds of titles rather than the more arcade style, then yeah, it's definitely worth looking at getting the full package for under a thousand US dollars, which is going to give you the uh, best experience possible with the CSLDD, which again, I think is going to be more than enough for most people and a really great pedal set as well. You might want to look at upgrading the wheel a little bit later on down the track, but I think this is going to be more than enough to get you started and keep you satisfied for quite some time. So yeah, I think that the way they've broken down the packages really does make a lot of sense. I think there's a clear entry point into more high-end gear here for most people and a clear upgrade path as well, which I think is really important. And I just, overall, I think it's just a really fantastic ecosystem. So I really hope that today's video has helped you out. If you do have any other questions that you would like answered, let us know down in the comments below. We'll drop a bunch of links down there as well to the more detailed reviews that we've done on various different components that we've looked at today as well. And as we mentioned at the top of the video, if you are looking at placing an order, We'll drop some links down in the description below as well, which do help the channel out with a small commission that comes our way if you do decide to purchase with no additional cost to you. But above all, thank you very much for watching. As always, please do leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, good luck with the pre-orders, guys. If you are placing a pre-order, uh, hopefully they don't sell out immediately. I know that it's been a bit of a struggle in the past. I know it's something that has caused quite a bit of frustration with, uh, you know, availability and things like that. But hopefully they're on top of things this time. Hopefully the website won't crash as well. And uh, yeah, happy racing, guys. I'll see you again soon. Bye.